So I am still at the X Takeover. Yes, uh, it hasn't happened yet, but you folks, uh, you know I'm a time traveler, so here I am in the past. Magic. Uh, I've got Ray here. Uh, Ray is the, I guess, owner, the CEO of Blue Power System, uh, the head honcho. Hi. I described him in the previous video as a, uh, as a electrical wizard, uh, <laughs> because he does things that I don't understand. <laughs> but I'm gonna ask him a bunch of amazing questions that you guys might want answers to about magnets, about batteries, about motors, uh, because he's got a, a depth of knowledge that is pretty unusual. Uh, I'm Brian, welcome to Futuraza. So Ray, first of all, yeah. do you want to show us what we're looking at? Because when I say there's a generator in the back of this uh, Blue Power Systems trailer, it is, uh, it sounds, it sounds like you just took something off the shelf and jammed it in. That is not what's going on. No, that's not so what's going on. So tell me what we're looking at here. Well, uh, this is one of the, the lowest emission tier four final engines that we can get that's controlled by a computer area network or CAN bus, more commonly known. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is actually an EV motor uh, that's being used and driven by the diesel as an alternator. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be 60 cycles when you're charging a battery because you're charging a battery. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then over here, that's tied to this, uh, this motor controller and that motor controller is good up to 100 kilowatts. It's liquid cooled, but it's actively rectifying the AC coming out of the generator head. What's the uh, Tesla wall charger for? That's for uh, charging up my Cybertruck. That's so, wonderful. So I wouldn't need to pull over to any charge stations if I wanted to go to Alaska. And all of the service parts, serviceable parts of the generator yeah. are on this side. That's right. And what's all this? Uh, you know, we have fuses, we have uh, a heartbeat battery, we have the battery that belongs to the diesel engine, uh, mm -hmm. you know, different relays. Because you so still got to have your low voltage. Right, that's right, to power the computers and stuff. Yeah. And so, uh, what we're talking about here is it's most generators are old dirt bikes that they really haven't changed much apart from the muffler. Not at all. They're not very efficient. That's right. What I hear you saying is if you were to run this generator, to power your Cybertruck, yeah. it would still use far less fuel than a diesel truck. Absolutely. So that's the kind of ridiculous magic and wizardry we're talking about here. Now, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about, uh, I had some speculative questions on Cybercab. Yeah. The, the first question I had is since, since it's not going to go over 85, the engineers have confirm that to me yeah. because that's the highest speed limit in the country. San Antonio Expressway tops out there. I think yeah. that's plenty aggressive for human travel sure. when most of them are uh, driving themselves. Since you're not going to be going that fast, since you're never going to do a jackrabbit start, you don't need a whole lot of motor. Would you say 80 to 100 horsepower is adequate? I would definitely say that. It's only two passengers. There's yeah. a limit to how much cargo you can fit. It's not that heavy of a that's vehicle. Right. So we're not talking a whole bunch of horsepower. Yeah. When I need less horsepower, when I need less torque, what does that mean for my motor? Well, you know, the motor can be a less expensive motor for sure. Mm -hmm. you know? Smaller, but also less exotic materials. That's right. And uh, now you've got some experience making motors. Yeah. Would you tell us about that? Yeah, my, all my experience with motors was primarily focused around the utilization of thin films uh, in the magnetics. So. Thin films started out as what we call amorphous metals back in the 70s. They were, it was uh, developed as a alternative to transformer laminations and, and a 10 times more efficient alternative at that. So really what it was is it was a kind of a, a strange discovery in a university lab that somebody had had a melt going of silicon iron and boron and a piece of it dropped into a vat of liquid nitrogen. <laughs> like they pulled it out and like, well, this is very interesting. What is this? And they cut, sliced it apart, looked at it under a microscope, and found out that it was uh, unorganized, the molecular structure, hmm. completely unorganized, not unlike what you look at when you see iron. Well, because when iron laminations are made, and the reason we have a 60 cycle distribution system is because when the iron cools, it forms domains based on the earth, because of the earth's magnetic field, as it going from a liquid to a solid state. So as that sheet gets processed and put into transformers and motors, you have to fight that loss, and that's what we call hysteresis loss. Hmm. So hysteresis loss is the, 
the energy that it takes to, to push in a magnetic field and, and so let it out. So if for some reason it took me even longer to cool my magnet, it would yeah. be even less efficient. Yes. And so uh, you've been able to, de to develop uh, brushless motors for uh, e-bikes or yep. yeah, some pretty unusual stuff. Yeah. So on the, on a, we only need 85 horsepower, 100 horsepower, uh, but we want good efficiency and we want a cheap motor. How do you do that without exotic materials? Well, if you're talking about a permanent magnet <clears throat> motor, there's various types, but a permanent magnet motor, you would want to get rid of the rare earth magnets inside of the motor if you mm -hmm. can. And the way to do that is, is through frequency. And these materials that I was telling you about, the thin film amorphous metals and or they're now evolved to nanocrystalline materials, they have an incredible frequency capability. So they can go many, many magnetic cycles per second, up to 5,000 at, at, oh. at similar losses as what we're doing 500 at today. So when you can go that fast, you don't need as much magnetic field. You just push a, you know, something like maybe a ferrite magnet or, or even a bonded neomagnet, something much less expensive than the rare earth magnet. So one of the, one of the things that uh, is very interesting about that is uh, the, cap the, the capability now also of the electronics that are catching up. So now we have silicon carbide FETs, MOSFETs, the, the things that are in these motor controllers. Mm -hmm. That means they can go many, many more times per second with the same losses, five times more than say a MOSFET, the silicon carbide FETs. So all these technologies kind of, they have to converge together, but they are now kind of converging together. So. so that's pretty crazy. And so we've talked about small motors. We talked yeah. about the e-bikes. We talked about bigger motors yeah. for the car. What about for a wind turbine? Could you make, wind turbines have an obstacle right now they're facing, which is yeah. that they're very big and the materials that go in them are controlled by one country. Yeah, yeah. Is there a way around that? Yeah, I mean, when you think about it is if you're bringing a, a high frequency uh, topology to a large diameter, let's say a wind turbine uh, motor, um, some, one of my patents, one of my first patents that I got back in, uh, in the 90s we used wound components from this material because it's a very thin one mil thick cross between glass and metal it's called it was called met glass by the way so it became a very uh, cost effective way to make these and then later in my life i came up with a way to make a radial gap machine first they started out as axial gap brushless machines then we made to radial gap well with the radial gap we have these u-shaped cores which can be deployed in a big diameter array mm -hmm. right so you have these just tiny little modules and you just it's just a matter of how many modules you want to put in it and how many magnets you have in the rotor will determine your frequency per rpm and so visually wouldn't that look a little bit like a world war ii fighter jet fighter plane motor it could it could <laughs> it depending on how big you want to make it but if the but if you have an application where you can really want a big R, high rpm like say you want to make a little turbo generator that's 120,000 RPM, well then you just have four, four magnets or two magnets and you'd still be able to get that screaming high frequency out of the magnetics. And again, those materials are more abundant. Yes. Um, and cheaper. Yeah. And, and more localized, that's potentially. Right. That's right. Because it's not just the fact that China has the, the resources for those exotic materials, it's that they also have the machines and the know how to make the machines and they won't sell us the machines. Yeah. Which is, I think, problematic. Uh, so if, if you want, uh, maybe that's what you should go into is making those machines pretty please. Um, is there anything about this machine I am forgetting to ask? Nothing about it. What, what the beautiful thing about this topology is, is that we can tune the torque on that alternator head to match with the fuel consumption, the lowest fuel consumption per kilowatt. Mm -hmm. And we have a page in this PLC here that, that does that. Because every engine has a, an RPM at which it is running at peak efficiency. Right. And you only run at that. Yep. Un unless... We call it the pop, the perfect operating point. There you go. And I guess if, I mean, I guess you, a customer could choose a different setting. Yeah, if you wanted to. If you needed to just max out the juice, we've got a festival we're needing to power. Yeah. Um, and we should mention, uh, because I'm sure someone will ask, uh, what is the price? Because uh, it is, uh, you know, not, the, not exactly a piece of consumer equipment today. No, this was built for utility applications, for uh, remote grids. 
And uh, so it was built as a in, you know, very industrial piece of equipment. So cost reductions haven't really touched this yet. No, yeah. and it may be a while because what it does is, um, it, it might take a while to get scale because it is a, a very unique product. Right. And the question still is out there is, is the remote grid spec the actual spec that the vast majority of people and oh, sure. applications want? And sure. you know, so your first 10 yeah. customers might be all different and not uh, the most common use. Right. So we choose one that could cover just about everybody, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Start, to start as, with as broad as you can. Right. And uh, I would ask who the first customer is going to be, but I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> Because, yeah. you know, I've already got a hint or two, but uh, that's for me to know and the world to discover. <laughs> so, guys, in the comments, what do we miss? What do we misunderstand? Uh, should I put them on speed dials when I've got weird questions about <laughs> magnets, about batteries, about motors? I can get some answers. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, guys. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. I thank you for your time. And guys, in the comments, what do we miss? What do we misunderstand? Leave it. Uh, comments today, unfortunately, mandatory. Yeah, it's a, it's just a temporary order. It'll be back to usual very soon. Like, subscribe. You know what you're doing. Stay tuned. Stay juicy. And I cannot wait to hear from you clever robots on the flippity flop. <laughs>